Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. In this video, I want to talk about 10 steps I would recommend for ending Jehovah's Witness abuses. Obviously, this is a YouTube channel that exposes and draws attention to Jehovah's Witness abuses. That said, the position I've always taken is that there is one method of attempting to do that that doesn't work and is actually counterproductive, and that's banning Jehovah's Witnesses outright, as is the case currently in Russia. And I realize many former Jehovah's Witnesses disagree with me on this, understandably given how much pain the Jehovah's Witness religion inflicts in people's lives through shunning, through the cover-up of abuse, etc. It's understandable that people would look at a country like Russia banning Jehovah's Witnesses and say, yes, that's what needs to happen everywhere. That way we end Jehovah's Witness abuse. And as I've pointed out repeatedly on this channel, it doesn't work that way because all you're doing is driving the abuse underground, making it harder for the authorities to intervene in, say, the cover-up of abuse. How do you hold an organization accountable for its child abuse policies if the organization technically shouldn't exist? And what you're also doing is feeding into the persecution narrative of the organization and giving the leadership just this infinite harvest of material, of stories that they can use as propaganda to point to how they're being persecuted and therefore people ought to sympathize with them or even consider the organization God's one and only true organization that was prophesied to be persecuted in the last days. So I think it's clear, if you've been watching my videos for a while now, that there's one way of ending Jehovah's Witness abuses that I do not support. And that being the case, I can imagine many saying, well, what would be your suggestion, Lloyd? What's your way of ending Jehovah's Witness abuses if you're not in favour of banning the religion? Well, I've got a list and we'll get stuck into item or step number one, former members speaking out. I realise this is already happening. You're watching a former member speaking out. There are many, many excellent YouTube channels where people are sharing their stories, where people are exposing Jehovah's Witness abuses. I'm by no means the only one, but I feel as though there is always, always room for improvement there. I feel, especially when it comes to the languages, as though there could be so much more material and content online because let's not forget this is a religion that impacts on people all over the world. And if you don't happen to speak English, my channel will be of only very limited use to you when it comes to understanding the various nuances of how Jehovah's Witnesses deceive and manipulate people. There really needs to be and I realise there are many YouTube channels in other languages. But as far as I can tell, we're still very much in our infancy as a movement in terms of just getting the word out there in as many languages as possible. Some languages have sadly very little by way of resources online. And... I would personally like to see more and more former members, both in other languages and in English, no matter what language we're talking about, I'd love to see as many as possible adding their voices to the conversation, sharing their experiences, sharing their perspectives, 
because no two perspectives will be the same. My criticism of a particular belief or practice may not be as persuasive as someone else's criticism of a particular belief or practice. We need as many voices as possible and there is always room for improvement in that direction. Step number two, we need better media engagement. And in my 10 years of activism, 10 years, wow, <laughs> it's gone by quickly, but I've been doing this in some form or other talking about Jehovah's Witnesses, explaining their abusive practices for that period. And I can remember when I first started out, it was actually quite rare for there to be any sort of decent journalism about, say, shunning or blood transfusions or child abuse. Now it seems that negative exposure, or to put it better, objective exposure of Jehovah's Witnesses. It feels as though objective exposure is a little bit more common. And it's been very encouraging in recent years to see multiple documentaries, multiple news reports in countries like the UK, countries like the US, Australia, drawing the public's attention to things that are wrong, most notably the cover-up of child sexual abuse, I just feel as though it's in the media's hands to a large extent for the public to understand the full horror of what's happening. I feel as though governments are never going to take action on, for example, the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses keep secret databases of child predators. Governments are never going to take action on that sort of thing if there isn't a public outcry and there isn't going to be a public outcry if there is insufficient or lacking media interest. If the media are too busy talking about what some celebrity is doing or saying or talking about, frankly, any number of trivial things and not focusing on an organisation that is inflicting misery on people's lives, perhaps because they're worried about being perceived as bigoted, about being perceived as picking on a religious minority, I feel as though there will never be any meaningful progress. That's just how I feel. The, it's, <laughs> worryingly, it's very much in the media's hands for there to be any significant progress when it comes to holding Jehovah's Witnesses accountable for the abuse that they are exporting and inflicting on people. Step number three, wider internet availability in developing countries. Again, there's been improvement here in countries around the world that are less affluent, there is wider access to the internet, but it's still very much the case, typically, that Jehovah's Witnesses grow more in countries where fewer people have access to the internet. And I like to think that this is an area that will sort of by its own momentum only improve in time. In other words, I see the internet as inevitably becoming more and more accessible to the point where pretty much everyone on the planet can access the internet. If you can't access the internet, how on earth are you supposed to know the subtle ways that Jehovah's Witnesses manipulate people how on earth are you supposed to know about Beth Sarim or um, the various scandals from Jehovah's Witness history, Rutherford's letter to Hitler, the Declaration of Facts, you name it. How on earth are you supposed to get access to that sort of information that you need to have when we're talking about an organisation representing itself as the one and only truth? 
how on earth are you going to be able to make proper decisions about whether or not to join an organization if you literally have only the organization's word for it? So you're living in a country, in a developing country. Jehovah's Witnesses are calling at your door, offering you material that appears legitimate, appears to be well-researched, and you don't have a means of fact-checking it. So again, hopefully, just with the inertia of societal progress, this is a step that will pretty much sort itself out. But I'm doing this as a list because it's not dependent on any one thing. We're not going to see an end to Jehovah's Witness abuses purely due to any one of these steps. But if we were to see all of them, if we were to see each and every step on this list realized, I for one can't see the Jehovah's Witness religion existing in anything like what we see today. Step number four, no more societal deference to religion. I feel this is something I've experienced personally as a core participant to ICSA, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse in England and Wales. When you compare ICSA and their work and their level of scrutiny in their investigation of Jehovah's Witnesses with what happened in Australia with the Australian Royal Commission, there are huge differences. And in my opinion, this is because certain countries have varying levels of deference to religion. In Australia, it seems that the country is more secular and they don't have as much reverence, perhaps, for religion as in other countries. Whereas the United Kingdom... Well, religion is very much strongly entrenched in British society to the point where, you know, the royal family has a role in the Church of England. I think the Queen is head of the Church of England. And in the House of Lords, which is part of the legislative process, there is a bench in the House of Lords uh, for bishops. <laughs> so if you reach a certain rank... In a certain religion in the UK, you get a say in lawmaking. I mean, this is frankly absurd. And it speaks to, again, how much deference to religion there is in British society. So I shouldn't have been surprised when Ixa dealt with Jehovah's Witnesses with kid gloves, in my opinion, didn't give them anywhere near the scrutiny that they deserved, despite there being a 6,000-strong petition pleading with ICSA to get the data on child sexual abuse within Jehovah's Witnesses in England and Wales, ICSA refused. Whereas in Australia, that was one of the first things they did. They went to Watchtower Australia and said, give us all of your records and got the data going all the way back to 1950. So unfortunately, there is so much deference to religion. And I feel as though when it comes to passing laws that will limit cults in their ability to abuse people and inflict damage in people's lives, there's always going to be a point where there's only so much that can happen. When countries hold religions on a pedestal and basically give them a blank check, when they say to religions, you know, you guys get to do pretty much what you want and as long as you're a religion, we're not going to interfere, how on earth are we going to see meaningful progress? Unfortunately, as I've said many times, and I may have to say it again in this video, we're living at the wrong point in history. And many of the frustrations that we see when we look around the world and we look at 
the free reign that's given to Jehovah's Witnesses to just go ahead and do some of the things that they're doing, it's purely because society hasn't caught up yet. There hasn't yet been enough progress. So point number five, properly enforced mandatory reporting. Mandatory reporting is certainly catching on. There are many states in the United States with mandatory reporting. There isn't mandatory reporting, however, in the United Kingdom. And the fear is, from people I've been speaking to, that if they were to bring in mandatory reporting in the UK, there would be loopholes. There would be ways where if you are an organisation that's in the business of covering up abuse, you could find ways of still doing it. And that's indeed the case in America. Even in states where there is mandatory reporting, they have what are known as clergy penitent provisions, which essentially, again, allow religions or churches to do whatever they want. So you have a duty to report child sexual abuse, but it's not quite the same if you happen to be, let's say, a Catholic priest hearing about child abuse in a confessional. Either you know of child abuse or you don't. There should be no religious loopholes. And this, again, is where societal deference to religion comes into play and sabotages efforts to hold religions accountable. We need mandatory reporting and we need mandatory reporting that will create an environment where people literally go to jail if they are found to be involved in the cover-up of child abuse. I strongly believe that every official involved with the Jehovah's Witness religion in, say, the service department and certainly all of the governing body members, they ought to be criminally prosecuted for doing what they're doing, for allowing predators to go unpunished so that they can amass even more victims. And it seems that the reason why that's not happening yet is because the law simply hasn't caught up. Again, we're living at the wrong point in history. There just hasn't been enough societal progress. We've come a long, long way since the Dark Ages, a long, long way in our laws and in civil rights and in all that sort of thing. But we're not there yet when it comes to making sure that our society is fair and that there is proper justice for all. Point number six, or step number six, no charitable status or tax breaks to abusive organisations. This should be an obvious one. I've been talking about this for years. How on earth can you have a situation where there is an abusive religious organisation that gets to call itself a charity while publishing materials describing former members as poisonous, as mentally diseased, while covering up child abuse, while telling women or abused spouses that they need to stick it out, that they are guilty of adultery if they move on with their lives and exit their marriage. How can you have a situation where organisations doing this effectively get sponsored by the state with the awarding of charitable status and the applying of tax breaks? I just don't understand it. And I'm personally of the opinion, I realise many aren't, I'm personally dubious as to why religions automatically get tax breaks, period. And I realise there are many religions that do wonderful work in the community, they do wonderful charitable work, 
And I think that any organisation that does charitable work should get tax breaks, but let's make it for the charitable work. Why are we awarding tax breaks to organisations that sell religious ideas? As far as I'm concerned, that's all a religion does. A religious set of beliefs, a dogma, is essentially, in my view, a product. It's something some people want and others don't. It's a set of beliefs that gives people whatever they want, some kind of sense of purpose, some kind of sense of enlightenment or spirituality, whatever. It's clearly not a necessity. It's clearly something where some people want it and others don't. Why should it be that religions that sell this product can get tax breaks, don't have to pay tax, when it's essentially a business, as far as I can tell? Again, if they're extending charitable services, if they're doing charitable work in the community, well, that shouldn't be taxed. But why just assume that all religions are doing charitable work, and even if they're doing charitable work, is it truly charitable, or are there strings attached? So I think, again, we're living at the wrong point in history, but I think there needs to be a total root and branch rethink of the relationship between church and state and the extent to which religions benefit financially from the state and from their status as religions. But you certainly shouldn't have a, a situation where an abusive religious organisation ruins people's lives and gets to call itself a charity and also doesn't have to pay tax. Now, there have been encouraging developments in this area as recently as January, January 27th, the county governor for Oslo and Viken in Norway, as many of you will know, issued an administrative decision denying the Jehovah's Witnesses a state subsidy for 2021. So Jehovah's Witnesses in Norway had literally been receiving money from the government on an annual basis and they've been denied that funding for 2021 due to some amazing work by people like Jan Frode Nielsen who've been campaigning, who've been telling their story in the media and pointing out how wrong it is that their country is helping to finance the abuses that they have experienced or seen firsthand. And I'm really heartened by that development. I just find it depressing that we're talking about basically one country doing this. I mean, where else is this happening? Where else, apart from countries where, obviously, Jehovah's Witnesses are being totally banned, where else are we seeing governments take a step back and say, you know what, maybe we shouldn't be giving subsidies or tax breaks or charitable status to an organisation that is violating people's human rights. That's happened in Norway. We need to start seeing it happen everywhere or in as many countries as possible, if that were to happen, that would be a major step in ending Jehovah's Witness abuses. Because again, we're talking about a business, a business that is pushing its product. And all businesses are dependent on their bottom line, on their cash flow, and if you want to disincentivize any organization from doing something, you need to hit them in the wallet. So it's nice to see that that happening in Norway, it would just be amazing and sorely needed for this to happen in other countries as well. Step number seven, we need to see no more 
HLC interference in medical decisions. Actually, the National Secular Society in the United Kingdom has been doing some fantastic work on this, as I've mentioned before on this channel. They did a study, I think last year, um, I will put a link in the description to an article titled Rethink Relations with Jehovah's Witness Committees, NSS Urges NHS, NSS is National Secular Society, NHS is the National Health Service. What the NSS did was they did their own research. They contacted all of the NHS trusts and they asked, what can you tell us about your relationship with Jehovah's Witness Hospital Liaison Committees? And what they found was, quote, there were several examples of trusts which refer to engagement with HLCs in positive terms and which encourage Jehovah's Witnesses and staff working with Jehovah's Witness patients to get in contact with them. So Jehovah's Witnesses going to certain hospitals in the UK are being encouraged to get in touch with their local HLC. And what's the job of a HLC? It's to make sure that Jehovah's Witnesses abstain from blood. They're not interested in saving lives. They're not interested in making sure that that Jehovah's Witness gets the best medical treatment no matter what. They are interested in pushing the blood command, the blood teaching, to abstain from blood. This again speaks to what I was saying earlier, religious deference. The United Kingdom has outrageous religious deference, and here's one more example of it. When you have entire trusts, so multiple hospitals falling underneath an NHS trust, and when you have multiple trusts essentially rolling out the red carpet to HLC elders and saying, please come into our hospital wards and please involve yourselves in the life or death medical decisions of our patients, that's got to end. That has just got to end. So I was really heartened when the National Secular Society drew attention to this. But again, we're just scratching the surface. This is only the beginning. This is only starting to shine a light on this grossly inappropriate practice. I think what's happening is hospitals, again, they don't want to appear bigoted. They don't want to appear to be turning down religious minorities or not being understanding of religious minorities. And that's leading them to go overboard in accommodating even religious minorities that are interested in persuading people to die over certain religious beliefs. I think some NHS trusts will be looking at Jehovah's Witness elders in the same way that they look at, let's say, a Catholic priest who's coming in to give the last rites. And they may see the two as being pretty much the same. It's not the same. Jehovah's Witness elders literally have a book called Shepherd the Flock of God that says if you willfully and unrepentantly accept a blood transfusion, you will be disassociated meaning you will lose contact with your family. But they never say that, I'm sure, when they go into these NHS trusts and when they meet with doctors. They never put their cards on the table and say, by the way, we punish people who accept blood. They spin the story, they spin the narrative, they mislead doctors and medical professionals, and this needs to stop if we're going to see an end to the particular Jehovah's Witness abuse of Jehovah's Witnesses being persuaded to die over the stance on blood. Step number eight, 
denying life-saving medical intervention for minors should be a criminal offence. I've thought long and hard about this as a parent and I can't see why that would be a controversial law to bring in. How, how is it legal for that to happen? How is it possible for parents in certain cases to legally deny life-saving treatment? Now, I'm not saying that parents don't have a say in what medical treatment their children receive, but when they're literally in a hospital setting and it's the opinion of medical professionals that a child will die imminently if they don't receive a given treatment and the clock's ticking and seconds count, how can it be legal for parents to say, actually, no, we're overriding, we're overruling your opinion, even if it means that the child dies. Now, fortunately, that's happening less. We're seeing in countries, particularly Western countries, more cases where the court will intervene. But I would like to see it made law. I would like to see it made a crime just so that there's nothing slipping through the cracks or to deter things slipping through the cracks, I would like to see it made a crime for any parent to effectively allow their child to die by denying them medical treatment that's advised by doctors. I don't expect to see that law come into action anytime soon. Again, way too much religious deference in society. But where's the downside to that? I mean, think about how many laws we have and how many things are criminal. It's a crime to speed in your car, you know? It's a crime to sell certain substances why isn't it a crime to allow your child to die by refusing them medical treatment? So, yeah, that's definitely on my list. Step number nine, there needs to be more awareness of cult influence among mental health professionals. And this is important, not just in terms of ex-members who've been in abusive groups getting help, one thing we routinely hear is that people exit an abusive religious group, doesn't have to be Jehovah's Witnesses, could be any number of groups, they've been subjected to essentially trauma and they go to their therapist and because their therapist doesn't understand cults and doesn't understand what cults do to people, they're given bad advice or they're given advice that doesn't adequately meet their mental health needs. I'm putting this on the list not necessarily for that reason, but because we need wider understanding among the academic community of what cults do to people. Think about it. If you are a legislator and you're looking at writing laws that will improve people's lives, that will right wrongs, that will end injustice, and you're casting your eye at religious groups, religious groups that have been accused of shunning people, of coercing abused spouses to stay in abusive relationships, what are you going to do? You're going to turn to the professionals, aren't you? You're going to turn to mental health professionals and people who study cults, and you're going to say, is there a problem here? Is this something where we need to be drafting legislation? And if the mental health professionals don't know about cults, and, for example, are in denial about things like cult mind control, call it what you will, whether you want to call it undue influence, brainwashing, mind control, I don't care. But when you have experts 
or scholars who are in denial about the mechanisms cults use to mislead people, how on earth are legislators going to make any progress? Now, interestingly, I had recently on the channel Yanya Lalic, who is, in my opinion, one of the very best cult experts. Thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. Haven't said that in a while. Um, Dr. Lalic is doing some fantastic work in this direction, and I would just draw your attention to um, Take Back Your Life Recovery website. The actual URL is tbylr.com. This is a new initiative that's been set up starting January 2022, so starting very recently, to educate people on what cults do, including mental health professionals. So you can literally sign up to courses where Dr. Lalic and others will educate on what cults are doing and how they are impacting on people emotionally and psychologically. Again, it's not the final answer, but we need to have a start. There needs to be a first step, doesn't there? Just like with what I was saying earlier about Norway, there needs to be one domino that falls first. And it's encouraging to see steps being made to better educate mental health professionals on what cults are doing. Because I can fully understand why cults wouldn't necessarily be central to your education when you are getting into psychology and how the brain works. You might consider it just a niche thing that affects some people and huh, I'm not really interested in studying that. I'll, I think I'll skip that subject. But it's such an important aspect of mental health when we're talking about trauma and religious trauma. There's way too little knowledge about it among the mental health community and among experts. And again, when you're a lawmaker and you're drafting legislation, who is it that you turn to? So this community in particular needs to be better educated and it's very encouraging to see Dr. Lalic and others making important steps in that direction. Which brings me to my final step in my list of steps for ending JW abuses and it's very simple. Critical thinking needs to be on school curriculums. I'm sure it probably is in some schools. I know my daughter Jessica has an option of doing critical thinking. I don't think this year, but in future years at school, she has an option between doing religious education and critical thinking. Now, I'm not against religious education per se, so long as it's done the right way and there's proper context. I actually think it's very important that we understand religions and how religions work and where they come from and what their beliefs are. Because religion forms such a, um, a large part of society. However, there just isn't enough critical thinking, is there? And we see this not just in the sphere of cults and how easy it is for them to manipulate people on a mass scale without wanting to get too political. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that we are sort of living in an age right now of misinformation. The internet has been perverted, I'm sorry to say, especially in recent years, and is being used in many cases as a tool for perpetuating wrong information, including information that can get people killed. Oh, vaccines are deadly, you know? And I know there are many anti-vaxxers who follow my channel. I'm sorry, your critical thinking is lacking if you're falling for the material that's being put online about modern medicine and about vaccines and about combating pandemics. 
There just isn't enough critical thinking. It's impacting us in how we deal with the current pandemic. It's impacting us on our politics. We're barraged with it. We're barraged with misinformation at every turn. It's having a real tangible impact on society. And we need to be educating people about it when they're at school. That's when they need the tools. That's when they need to be given the tools to sort through this barrage of misinformation and learn how to separate fact from fiction. Learn how to spot logical fallacies. Learn how to fact check. These are all things children should be taught. And unfortunately, we're nowhere near where we ought to be in that direction. So those were my 10 steps for ending Jehovah's Witness abuses. Again, it's not like none of those things are happening at all. In some areas, we're starting to see the beginnings of some of those things happening or potentially happening in the future. But again, we I hate to end on a negative note, we're just at the wrong point in history. Future generations, as I've said many, many times, will look back on the time in which we live and say, why on earth were they allowing religious organizations to do that? Why on earth were they allowing groups like Jehovah's Witnesses to keep secret databases of child predators with names that weren't being handed over to the authorities. How was that happening in 2022? Future generations will be aghast at what is being allowed to happen right now, largely, again, due to societal deference to religion. But as I often tell myself, when you're dealing with a problem, the first step is to recognize what the problem is. Maybe, just maybe, just by talking about it, not just here on this video, but among our friends, I don't know, maybe we can push further in this direction so that we can, I don't know, contact our elected representatives, contact journalists, get more media engagement. There has to be a beginning, doesn't there? And yeah, these are the ways that I think we might finally, even if it's not in my lifetime, but maybe future generations will see something approaching an end to the abuse that so many of us are hurting from the breaking apart of families, the covering up of child abuse, the persuading of people to die rather than accept blood. These things are unacceptable in the 21st century. And I like to think that one day, one day, society will rise to the challenge and make sure these things end. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching.